Today, we're making this realistic bronze material, complete with procedural bump and roughness imperfections. I'll go through both procedural and extra realistic options. Also, make sure to stick around if you want to find out a bonus tip for taking your reflections up a notch with a commonly untouched setting. I'm going to add a bronze material to a simple ball, so I'll add one by pressing Shift A and then selecting Cube. Wait, Cube? Yeah. We're actually going to use a cube because we can get an ideal UV using a cube. Before I turn my cube into a sphere though, I'm going to need to UV unwrap it in a certain way for use with the more realistic option. So I'm going to drag out my right hand corner, change this drop down here to UV editor. Then I'll press tab to go into edit mode and you can see we have our default cube UV. I'll press A in the viewport to select all my faces, then press U and then choose cube projection. That will make it so the texture is placed evenly across every single face. Now we've done that, I'm just going to quickly left click and drag this top corner to make my viewport the focus. The type of sphere we're making is commonly known as a quad sphere. I'll start off by adding a modifier by pressing Ctrl 1, which is a hotkey for adding a subdivision surface modifier with one here in the levels. I'm going to change this up to 30. Then I want to make my changes permanent, so I'm going to left click this drop down and left click apply. Also, I want my sphere to be shaded smooth, so I'll right click it and then press shade smooth. You'll notice that our sphere looks a little bit cube-like still, so we want to make it a little bit more spherical. To do that, I'll press tab to go into edit mode, A to select everything, then under mesh, in transform, you can use this to sphere command. And if I just type in number one, now it will completely make it spherical. Great, now we're ready to start doing materials. First of all though, we need a workspace to make our material in. So I'm going to change my timeline here to the shader editor, which is a great way to visually see what we're doing. I'll press plus new to add our material, and I'm going to come in here and change some of my very basic settings. I'll start off by adjusting my color. I'm going to set it to this orange color, but you can see we still can't see any changes in our viewport. And that's because we need to change our viewing mode from solid to either material preview or the shader preview. I'm going to change the viewport shading since it's a little bit faster when recording. I'm also going to change my metallic value up to one. It's important to make sure this metallic value is set to either zero or one for all materials. Since bronze is a metallic material, it's important to set it to one. I might make some adjustments to the color. The exact color I ended up with was this hex number. A hex number is a number which is given to every single color in the RGB system. You can just copy this number in the hex option in order to get the same color as me. Now I'm going to get started by adding some nice grooves to my material. To do this I'm going to press shift A and under input I'm going to add texture coordinate. Alternatively you can just search for every node. I'm going to press shift A again and this time under texture I'm going to add one of Blender's built-in textures called the noise texture. I want my noise texture to be placed on the object based on the object itself rather than a UV. So I'm going to plug object into the vector. To preview what my noise texture looks like, I'm going to plug my factor into the surface. Now to turn this into grooves, I'm going to need to add another node called the mapping node. This is found under the vector, but again, you can just search it. I'll plug it in here and you'll notice the mapping node has these location, rotation and scale values. This allows us to adjust the texture without adjusting the values within the texture itself. It also allows us to do some things we can't do within the texture. For example, we could rotate it, and you see it looks like a spinning ball now, as I rotate this Z value. But the value we're looking for is scale. We want to scale this on the Z axis to create some nice grooves. To do that, I'm going to change my Z value to 50. Now you can see we have loads of grooves. You can notice when I've zoomed in, we still got a bit of jaggedness across our sphere. So to fix that, I'm going to add another modifier. In object mode, I'll left click my sphere and press Ctrl 1 to add another subdivision surface. You can see that smoothed that out nicely. If I plug my principal BSDF back into the surface, you can see our surface imperfections to make the grooves aren't visible. To do that, I'm going to need to use a special node called the bump node, which allows me to turn black and white data into surface detail. I'll press shift A and I'm going to search for bump, but you can also find this in the vector menu. I'm going to plug my normal into the normal. The reason why we're using it in the normal channel is because bump works by editing the normals of this object. Every face has a normal to create the illusion of model details, where really it's just pixel level adjustments to the normal. If you don't understand what normals are, I have a whole video dedicated to explaining it. You can find that in the top right hand corner. For now, I'm going to plug my factor back into the height. Now you can see we have some pretty strong grooves here. I think a strength of one is a bit too strong for my bump. So I'm going to change the strength value to 0 0.05. Now you can see we have some subtle grooves on our object. If we want to see how this will look like in cycles for a render, we'll need to go into the render preview. If I left click this ball here, it'll take me into render preview, but you can see our scene is totally blank. For you, you might be able to see a little bit, but for me, I'm going to need to add a HDRI to give us some realistic lighting. To add an HDRI, we're going to go to the world properties here, and I'm just going to press plus new. Then where it says color, I'm going to left click this yellow dot and change it to environment texture. Then if you want to use an HDRI, you can download one from this free resource I use called Polyhaven. I'm going to pick one of the ones I downloaded from the site. Now we can get a rough idea of how our bronze material will look when we render. I'm going to come back into my material preview though, 
because unfortunately this render preview mode causes issues with my microphone due to its intensity on my computer. So we've got our first bump details but we need to try and keep ourselves organized because things are going to get messy really quick. So I'm just going to drag and box select all these nodes and then I'm just going to press Control J to join them together. Here you will see a side panel and to open this you just press the letter N on the keyboard. Under label I'm going to name this. I also decided to invert my bump node as I find the result looks a little bit nicer. Essentially what invert is doing is taking the black and white data from the factor and saying where things are white will make them black and where things are black will make them white. Pretty straightforward. You might be wondering though, does white or black correspond to bump or no bump? Well, I like to think of it as black being off or zero and white being one or on. So when the lights are on, it's bright and when the lights are off, it's completely dark. That means that every part of the texture that's black will have a bump of zero, meaning it won't be altered. And everything with a value of one will have a bump of one, meaning the bump is completely influenced. This will work the same way for all the parameters on our shader. The next one we're going to be altering is the roughness and you can see it has values from 0 to 1. First of all though, the contrast of the black and white noise texture is a little bit too strong so I'm going to need to adjust it with a color ramp. I'll press shift in and under a converter I'm going to click color ramp. I'm going to plug the color of this color ramp into the surface of the material output and I'll plug my noise texture factor into this color ramp. Now you can see what our color ramp looks like. Now remember as we discussed the areas that are white here are going to represent the areas that are bumping out on our bump but since we inverted it it will actually be the other way around. Now, Generally, in the crevices, there's going to be a higher amount of roughness. That means that in our case, these white areas should have a higher roughness. Usually, it'd be the other way around, but remember, we inverted our bump. But the contrast is a little bit too high, so I'm going to adjust the difference between this black and white. So I don't want some parts to be super reflective and other parts to be hardly reflective at all. I'm going to set the black color by left-clicking on the notch and then left-clicking this bar here and changing it to a much lighter color. This gray value will give us a much higher roughness as it's a lot closer to white, which would be completely rough. We want the areas that are now white to be a lot higher as they are going to be a little bit rougher because they're grooves. So I'm going to set it to a value around here. Now we can go ahead and we can plug the color of this value into the roughness and then we can plug our BSDF into the surface so we can see it. Now you can see we have some nice base roughness for our material. But we want to add some more reflections to increase the realism. But remember that secret setting I told you about at the start? We're going to quickly add that. We're going to want to set it to the value used for bronze which is 1.1. This is a great way to subtly increase the realism of our material. Now you've got two options for the rest of the video. Option one is you go for procedural workflow which requires no more downloads and allows you to just use Blender to create some more reflections. However if you want a more realistic option we're also going to be covering how to use these texture imperfection maps to create some more roughness and perfections. If you want the more realistic option you can skip to this time here. Otherwise you can just keep watching the video just now for the procedural option. So so what are we going to use for our imperfections procedurally? To do this, we're going to press Shift A and then under Texture, I'm going to choose a Musgrave Texture. If you want to preview this quickly, you can of course use your Control Shift T with the Node Wrangler. Otherwise, you can just plug this in to the surface. This is what our default Musgrave Texture looks like, but we need to map it across our object coordinates. So to do that, I'm going to press Shift A again, then under Input, I'm going to add a texture coordinate. I'll plug my object into the vector. I'm going to maybe change my scale a little bit, maybe changing it to a value of 7.5. Now we could plug this into the roughness, but we need to mix it in with our other roughness. So to do that, we're going to need to use a mix node called the Mix Color. So I'll press Search, and I'm going to search for Mix Color, and I'm going to plug that here. Now you might be thinking we would plug the Musgrave Texture into the B socket, but actually we're going to be using the Musgrave texture as a mask. So we just plug it into the factor. The factor is supposed to blend between what goes in A and what goes in B, which for now B is just this color here. If you want to know more about how mixed nodes work, I have a dedicated video on the subject. You can find that in the top right hand corner just now. I'm going to plug the height of my Musgrave into the factor. Now A will represent the color black here. So that means that the roughness grooves we've made are going to be showing wherever there is black on this texture. B is going to represent the white areas. So we're going to want to add a more more rougher version of our grooves here. To do that, we can just start off by pulling out our color from our color ramp and I'm going to search for a hue saturation value node. I'm going to plug my color into the color. You can see though, my nodes are getting a little bit cramped. So I'm going to left click and box select some of them and just drag them out. It's important to keep your nodes organized since things do get quite complex quickly. I'm then going to plug my color into the B socket. But right now, since we haven't changed any of the hue saturation values, we've pretty much just created the same texture. So I'm going to want to maybe increase the value, which will make this color closer to white meaning we'll have more roughness in the areas which are white on this object, creating a fingerprint-like look. I found that 1.2 was a good value to go for, 
so I'm going to set it to 1.2. But you can adjust with this yourself until you find something you're happy with. Now, in order to preview what it's looking like, I'm going to plug my BSDF back into the surface. Now you can see we have some subtle marks on our roughness, giving us some extra detail. If you want to see what the effect we created is doing, you can increase the value here on the hue saturation value node. So let's say something like 2. Now you can really see the effect we made, but obviously this is too strong to be realistic. And these surface imperfections tend to be subtle in nature. So I'm going to change it back to 1.2. Now I'm going to need to organize everything. So I'm going to drag and box select like these two nodes, pull them a bit closer. Once I'm happy with how everything's organized, I'm just going to box select like these four nodes here and press Control J in order to create a box around them. I'm just going to call this procedural imperfections. In fact, I might call this mixing procedural imperfections since that's more accurate to what's been done. Welcome to those of you who decide to go for a more realistic option. Since we just finished doing a procedural option, we're just going to quickly unplug everything here by just removing all these sockets. And I'm just going to move my procedural imperfections over here and out of the way. We're going to be doing a very similar thing, except we're going to be using different texture coordinates and we're going to be doing two levels of detail. So first of all, you'll need to download these two textures from CG Bootcase. CG Bootcase creates free textures online and they're all CCO, which I believe means they don't have any copyright attached to them. But if you want more information on it, you can look into it yourself. In order to add my texture into my scene, I'm going to press Shift A, then under Texture, I'm going to add Image Texture. This allows us to access a texture on our computer. So I'll press Open and then you can just find the Dust Wipes texture. Now I've added it into my scene, I'm going to need to change the color space to non-color since it's a black and white image. In order to show you what this texture looks like, I'm going to plug my color into the surface. This is the kind of texture we've been given. Now we're going to want to make sure it's using the UV coordinates, although I believe it should be using it by default. Something I actually forgot to do earlier was name my material. So I'm going to left click it here and then just type in word bonds. Now we can add our texture coordinate node by pressing shift A Then under input we can press texture coordinate. Then I'll plug my UV into the vector since this time we're using the UV we made at the start. Now if you follow along with the procedural workflow we're going to be doing the exact same thing. Since we're mixing it in with our other roughness here, we're going to press Shift A and we're going to add a mix color node by just searching mix color. This texture here is going to act as our mask, which gets plugged into the factor. A factor is a mixture between color A and color B. And we're going to want to mix our grooves, which is this color ramp here, with a brighter version of our grooves. That way, where the areas are lighter, they'll be the same texture, but with a higher roughness, allowing us to create our dust sections while still maintaining our grooves. So for now, I'm just going to plug my color ramp into both A and B, which will be essentially creating the exact same texture. And I'm going to plug my dust wipes into the factor. To view what this is looking like, I'm going to plug my result into the surface of the material. Output. You can see we have the exact same texture we made earlier for our grooves. To change that and see our dust wipes effect, we're going to need to add a, a node called the hue saturation value. So I'll press shift A and then choose hue saturation value and I'll plug it for B. Make sure color is plugged into color and you should be good to go. I'm going to change my value up because as I mentioned earlier, I want the brighter areas of my dust wipes texture to be a brighter version of our grooves. Brighter meaning more roughness. You can see when I've increase this to 1.2, you've now got the dust wipes texture coming through. But in order to make it clear what it's doing, I'm going to quickly set it to 2 just to demonstrate. Now you can see we've got two versions of our grooves texture. I'm going to change my value back to 1.2. I'll plug my result back into the roughness and I'll plug my principal BSDF back into the surface. And now we have our dust wipe imperfections added to our material. Now our nodes are again a bit messy again, so I'm just going to left click and box select these nodes, press Control J, keep them in one container, and I'm going to change the label to mix in dust. To add some extra realism, we're going to add in our fingerprints texture. But since we're using the same setup, I'm just going to left click and shift select all of these nodes and press shift D to duplicate. I'll just place them here. Now we need to make more space for our new nodes. So I'm just going to box select my last two nodes and just drag them out. Then I'll pull in my node panel here. I'm going to rename this to mix in fingerprints. Now we need to replace our texture with the fingerprints one. I'll zoom into my image texture, press this X button, press open, and I just added the fingerprint texture on my computer. I'll then change my color space to non-color since it's a black and white texture. And now we just need to hook everything up. So now this mix node is now our combination of our grooves and our dust imperfection. To mix these in, all I need to do is plug my result into the A and plug my result into the color. And I want to keep my value on the hue saturation node at 1.2, just like I did for the other one. I'll then plug my result into the roughness and get ready because we're now going to have our final result. Awesome, there we have it, our realistic bronze material. Now let's have a quick quiz to cover some of the things we learned today. Number one, what commonly unused setting did we change for extra realism? Number two, what's the difference between the procedural workflow and the realistic image texture one? Number three, what shades or colors represent 0 and 1 respectively when we were working with the bump node and the roughness node. Make sure to pause the video and take time to answer the questions. Then when you're ready, you can press play again 
and listen to the answers. Number one, what commonly unused saying did we change for extra realism? This saying was called the IOR, which actually stands for index of refraction. We used the actual physical index of refraction for bronze to take our reflections up a notch in realism. Number two, what's the difference between the procedural work and the realistic image texture? Technically, in both workflows, we actually use procedural, but the difference is in the second workflow, we used image textures with procedural textures. The difference though is procedural textures like the grooves we made and the Musgrave imperfections can be done inside a blender, whereas the more realistic option requires textures from outside the blender to be used. Another thing I didn't mention though is that the procedural textures are mathematically generated, meaning they aren't limited by pixels, unlike the image texture. Also, the image textures that we got from online needed to be used with the UV texture coordinate. Number three, what shades or colors represent zero and one respectively? If we remember, zero represents black and one represents white. I like to think of this as when the lights are off, it's zero and when the lights are on, it's one. If you're unsure if you answered the questions correctly or not, you can write them in the comment section below and I'll answer them for you. Also, if you enjoy my teaching style, I also provide one-on-one -on -one coaching, complete with personalized lessons and post-lesson quiz questions and support. Link in the description if you're interested. Thank you for making it to the end of the video, you can also support the channel by making a one-time donation through Super, but even just liking, subscribing and sharing if you enjoyed is more than enough to support the channel. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.